All right, let's go ahead and pray. We'll get started. Father, we thank you. We praise you, Lord. We thank you for that time of worship. We thank you, Lord, for, for drawing us closer into your presence. We pray, Lord, that, that right now that you would just continue to reveal yourself through your word, that you would speak to us right now. We thank you for this opportunity to come together. We pray that you would be glorified through that. We thank you again. We praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Um, let me go ahead and read the scripture. We'll go ahead and start with that. So we're, we're, we're continuing the series on Haggai. Um, for those of you that weren't with us last week, just to give you a very quick refresher. Uh, with, with Haggai, what, what happened was um, basically everything that Israel believed in, everything that, that, the, that the Jews had thought was of value, that, that they thought was of, of, of glory to them as a race, had been taken away from them. They had been split into two kingdoms, north and south. The north kingdom fell quickly to the Assyrians, and the southern kingdom had fallen to, to, the, to the Babylonians. They were taken from their homes, their temple, the, the object of, of their glory, the object of, of, of worship, all these different things had been destroyed. And they were no longer in their homes. Everything that they had, had cherished was taken away from them, and for 70 years it was like this. And as far as they understood, God had left them. God had disappeared from their lives. And so, a miracle happens. The Persian emperor decides, you know what? You can go back to Jerusalem. You can go back. You can even rebuild your temple. And I'm going to give you the money to rebuild that temple. This is one of those points in history that has no explanation. When you study history and you look at it, you're like, this does not make sense unless you apply God and His plan to it. And in the midst of that miracle, they go back to Jerusalem, 50,000 of them. And for two years, they work hard, they build a foundation, they're excited, and then they meet opposition. These other kingdoms that surround it said, you know, hey, we're going to put pressure on these guys. We don't want the Jews to have power again. And so they gave in to that pressure. For 16 years, they did nothing. For 16 years, they continued to live their own lives. Even though God had given them a purpose to rebuild the temple, they decided to build their own houses. And that was the word that was given to them that we talked about last week. That God said, consider your ways. What are you doing? I gave you the purpose of rebuilding my temple, of rebuilding my house, and you're building your own houses. So this passage is going to continue from there. So Haggai 1, verses 12 to 15 says this. Then Zerubbabel, son of Shotel, Joshua, son of Jezodak, the high priest, and the whole remnant of the people obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the message of the prophet Haggai because their Lord their God had sent him. And the people feared the Lord. Then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, gave this message of the Lord to the people. I am with you, declares the Lord. So the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, son of Shiltel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, son of Josedach, the high priest, and the spirit of the whole remnant of the whole people. They came and began to work on the house of the Lord Almighty, their God, on the 24th day of the sixth month. Next slide, please. So what I want to first talk about is, is the power of presence. And this is something I, I want you to just think about, that just the simple act of someone, someone being in the same room, being in the same general vicinity, that that actually has a power over you. Right? Now obviously growing up as a child, this, this is a very easy thing to understand, because when you look at children, all of a sudden everything is different when they're by their parents. Right? You take away the parent, and the child is confused, the child is, is scared, the child is, is you know, just crying out. Right? Have you guys ever had one of those moments when you're a kid, and you, you think you're following your parent, and then all of a sudden you're like holding on to someone else's leg? Right? You guys ever have that when you're a kid? You guys remember that moment? And then all of a sudden, everything, all the safety that you thought you had was just, just vanished immediately, and you start crying. Right? And then, you know, your mom or your dad comes running around the corner, and like, oh, Jima, and they pick you up, right? You, you, guys, you guys have, I'm sure you have experienced that moment, if not seen that yourselves. 
I remember when I, I started attending this church in, in Austin, Texas, um, there was this very large babe, we called him linebacker, um, because he was really big. Um, his name was Aiden. Um, but anyway, I remember one of my first memories of Aiden was, I'm about the same size of his dad. So he's like tugging at my leg, I'm like, what is this kid? And then he looks at me, he starts crying. And now this, this he's a high schooler now. He's a grown, he's a, he's a grown man now, right? And so I'm like, hey man, I remember the first time I met you. I thought it was your dad. <laughs> you cried like a baby. <laughs> but anyway, that presence, that presence has a power over us. You know, I, I know Francis Chan is a pretty famous speaker, and I know he was he's actually still here in Korea, I believe. Um, but, but he uses this analogy by having his, his daughter come to him on stage and hugging him. And talking about how even in front of thousands of people, his daughter should be afraid, right? She's in an unusual circumstance, but all she's thinking about is her father's embrace. And he uses that as an analogy to explain how the presence has power over us. That presence gives us protection. And even so, um, you know, there's other types of presences out there, right? Like, there's some people, famous comedians, that even before they open their mouths, you want to laugh. You know what I'm talking about? There's people that just... The, the, you know, it could be the way they look. Some people look funny, obviously. But, but it, it's just that presence. The moment they come on the stage, you're expecting to laugh, no matter what they say. Right? Now, on the flip side, you might have people that the moment they enter the room, the mood goes down. <laughs> right? That, that very emo, that very negative person comes into the room, and then all of a sudden everyone's like, oh. Right? So it's a very unusual thing. How strong just... Physical presence has power over us. Next slide, please. But the thing about presence is presence only has its full power when you actually acknowledge that it's there. Right? You know, let's say you're that nervous child playing your first piano recital. Right? Some of you have probably had moments like this. Thankfully, I never had to do a recital. Um, my piano skills are terrible. <laughs> uh, I did play saxophone a couple times, but my parents never came, so it was a bad example for me. But regardless, you know, let's say you're that child, and, and, and you know, you're, you're waiting for your parents to come, and you don't see them. But let's say they came, and you didn't notice. That power of that presence that, that had you been able to see them is diminished because you weren't able to recognize their presence. So as interesting as, as presence is in terms of the power that it has over us, that power is limited if we don't actually recognize that presence is there. Okay? Hold that thought. We're going to get back to it. Next slide, please. This is a very wordy quote. Um, I'm going to have a simplified version next. But, but what this says is, when the people of God respond to the words of God, God himself responds back to them. This is what happens in this passage. God has proclaimed a word saying, consider what you're doing, build my house, not your own, and the people respond. Right? The passage talks about how, how they obeyed the voice of the Lord. And God himself responds back to them by saying, I am with you. And also by stirring their spirits. Next slide, please. The, the more simple version is, when we respond to him, he responds to us. It's very simple. That, that's, that's, that's how God works. He's not just this remote being, the supreme force. He is a responsive God. That when He speaks, and when we actually are stirred to obey, He responds back to us. Next slide, please. Very famous passage, Second Chronicles seven fourteen says this: If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and heal their land. God responds to us. You know, for those of you that that haven't experienced this, you know. I want you to understand that we worship and we know a God. A God who is sovereign, a God who is creator, 
that doesn't just want our devotion, but actually responds to our needs. After you look at this, this passage, it, it doesn't really, like, you don't really get the sense from the people that they actually want their land healed. Right? What you notice with God is He responds, but He adds a little extra on top. That's one of the cool things about God, is, is when He responds, He puts that little cherry on top. He, he, he gives you more than you deserve, more in abundance. That's the heart of God. Is he wants to give to you. Next slide, please. So, so in this passage, we see that there are two things that God responds with. He responds first with his presence, but he also responds by giving power. Two things that happen in this passage. He says, I am with you, and then you see that their spirits are stirred. The passage makes it clear that, that what actually prompts them, what actually gets them to get off the ground and to actually start building the house of the Lord is actually God himself giving them that strength. But it starts first with them responding positively. Next slide, please. Now, I bring up all these passages because... God saying, I am with you. God saying, you know, I will go with you wherever you are. This is something that happens throughout the Bible. This is a very common promise that God gives. And so I just threw out a couple examples. Um, you know, you have in Exodus 33, 14, My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. This is Moses. This is right after um, the, you know, the, the golden calf, and right after the, the whole nation of Israel has sinned. And God is angry, and He says, you know what? First He says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wipe out the Israelites. And then, you know, Moses pleads with him, and He says, okay, I won't do that. But I'm just going to go in front of you. I'll be with you, Moses, but I won't be with the people. And that's this verse right here. Moses actually re responds and says, if I have found favor in your eyes, go with us, not just me. Moses pleads with him. We'll talk about this a little bit more next week. But Moses pleads with him to go with all of them, to be among his entirety of his people. And God honors that request. That's where the tabernacle comes from. We'll talk about that a little bit next week. Joshua 1, nine. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. This is after the Be Strong and Courageous passage, where, where Joshua is taking over leadership for Moses. And God promises him, you have my word, but you also have my presence. I will go with you. Be strong and courageous because I am with you. The last passage is a very, you know, passage you should be familiar with. Matthew 28, 20, the end of the Great Commission. Jesus is himself saying, And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Jesus in turn made that same promise. He was about to go up. He was about to ascend into heaven. But he told his people, I'm going to be with you forever. I'm going to be with you forever. That promise of the presence of God in our lives is a common theme throughout the Bible. Next slide, please. So much so that the name that, that Jesus takes for himself, that is given unto him in the book of Isaiah, Emmanuel, literally means God with us. God with us. That's what his name, the name that was given unto him, means God with us. Brothers and sisters, this is, is one of the things that, that really separates the Christian God, that really separates Christianity from other types of religions in the sense that understanding that we have a personal relationship. This isn't a God that, that, that just created the world and just set it on its course, as, as the deists believe. That, that, that's remote from us and that doesn't respond to us at all. This is a God that desires a relationship. This is a God that desires intimacy. This is a God that, that even sacrificed His own Son so that we could be in that type of relationship with Him. Him knowing that we didn't deserve it. Him knowing that there was a need to, cl to cleanse us and to purify us so that we could be standing before Him. 
This is the God we love. This is the God that we worship. One that continually pleads with us. One that continually reaches out toward us. You know, when you, when you look at, at the story of the prodigal son, the, the, the line that really gets to me is that when the prodigal son is returning home, and him representing the, you know, the sinner that's kind of coming back to God, is that the father saw him from afar and ran toward him. What that means is that God was constantly pursuing him. God was constantly trying to, to renew that relationship with him. That's the kind of God that we have a relationship with. Not one that if we, you know, if we make him mad, he just kind of gets all, you know, Peter's son runs away. Right? That's not God. No matter how much we turn our backs on him, no matter how much we reject him, he still is waiting there, pleading for us. He pursues us. That's the God that we have. And so with that, you know what, when you, when you look back at this passage, you look at this particular point in history, this was a people that had felt that God had left them. And even though a miracle had happened, and they were back in a position where they could reclaim their city, where they could rebuild this temple, they gave up. And you have, to rep you have to understand that this temple represented not only a house of prayer and worship that we talked about last week, but this, this temple also represented the very presence of God. Right? You know, just to go back, you know, when Moses made that plea, and they built this big tent, there was this big tent called the tabernacle, and in that tent you would have different sections, and the presence of God would get thicker and thicker in different sections until you got to the Holy of Holies, right? Where the, the presence of God was so thick that the high priest could only go in there once a year. It was on, the, it was on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. You know, if you know the story, the high priest would go in there, he would wrap a rope around him with a cowbell. And he would go in there to offer the sacrifices for the, the sins that weren't, you know, the sins were, were like forgiveness wasn't asked for, right? Unnamed sins. So this would happen once a year. The high priest would go in there with a little cowbell. The reason why they put the cowbell and the rope was because if he wasn't holy enough, if he wasn't pure enough, he would face judgment and get zapped. And so they would listen to the cowbell. And if the cowbell stopped making noise, they would pull out a dead body. <laughs> kind of scary, I know. But that's the seriousness of, of the presence of God. That there is actually... I don't want to get too much into what the presence of God means, but there is a level of judgment that happens in the presence of God. And that, that big tent, that tabernacle, became this temple. Right? David wanted to build a temple, and it was through his son, Solomon, that this temple was actually realized. And there was this beautiful building, the very peak of all of Israelite history, was this beautiful building to worship God. And in this passage, it stands in ruin. It's destroyed. And you have to understand, for an Israelite at that time, to see that temple destroyed, to them, God wasn't with them anymore. There was no place for Him. His home was destroyed. Yet He reassures them in this passage and says, I am with you. That temple's not built yet, but my presence never left you. How comforting, how reassuring, and, and and then they're stirred up. They're stirred up. Go to the next slide, please. Actually, um, just to go back to this point, God's presence never left the Israelites. Never. They just didn't notice that it was still there. Presence only has power when you acknowledge that it's actually there. So when God reminded them, I am with you, He was pointing them back to the presence that had never left them. And then all of a sudden, that presence that had always been there regained its power because they recognized that, oh yes, God, you are with us. 
And so why do I keep belaboring this point? The reason why is because my question to you is, do you feel that God is present in your life? Are you struggling with, with, with different things right now and, and you feel that, that, that God is not with you? Let me tell you first and foremost that that presence has never left. No matter whatever circumstance you've gone through, no matter whatever difficulty that you've faced, God's presence has never left you. Now at the same time, prayer, worship, go hand in hand with experiencing the presence of God. And so what I want to encourage you is first to recognize that the presence of God will never leave you. No matter what you do, no matter what happens to you, no matter what you're facing, that presence will never leave you. But you got to remember that it's there. And there's also an active element in going into that presence. For myself personally, when I worship, when I sing praise unto God, that presence becomes more tangible to me becomes more real to me. And so what I want to encourage you is first, remember that presence has never gone away. But second, sometimes you, you're required to do something to actually encounter that presence. You know, in, in the temple they had this thing called showbread. It was this, this table that had just 12 loaves of bread on it. And that represented the presence of God. And it was, a, it was a physical reminder for the Jews when they saw that showbread that God was present. God was providing for them at all times. But more so than that remembrance, more so than, than knowing that He's there. Like I said, God desires relationship. God desires building and building that relationship with So I encourage you guys. Whatever it is, whether it's prayer, whether it's worship, whether it's listening to, to, to praise songs, whatever it is, I encourage you to seek out time to be in the presence of God. Every day if possible. Because there's nothing more encouraging, nothing more lovely than being in His presence. You know, for me in particular, you know, because of my age, there's particular songs that, that help me get to that presence. And they're songs that most of you don't know because they're old. <laughs> you know, for older people, it might be hymns. Whatever it is, regardless, find out that, that thing that helps you. Whatever it might be. And make it a practice of just dwelling in His presence. And being in that embrace. Like that analogy with Francis Chan. Being in that embrace and letting your worries disappear. Because when you're not in that presence, where you're not seeking that, 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 that moment with God, all these problems, all these distractions, all these other things seem a lot bigger than they really are. slide please um, when you're in that presence when you're in that presence I'm having interference problem all right when you're in that presence that presence empowers you we see that in the passage that after God says I am with you the people are stirred into action they are empowered Acts 1a which is kind of becoming a theme verse for this particular church is but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. The Holy Spirit is God Himself dwelling in you. And when you're in that presence, you're built up and you find yourself able to face things that you never thought you could. God gives us His presence. God gives us relationship, but He also builds us up and empowers us to be overcomers for 
Next slide, please. So the first point is when God speaks to you, and we talked about this last week, when God speaks, the best time to act on it is right now. But when you act, when you respond to God, He responds back to you. But like I said, sometimes being in that presence requires a little bit of action on our parts as well. But regardless, it's Him giving us that presence. It's Him giving us His power. So when we hear from God, when He speaks to us, act. Do not be afraid to act. But find your encouragement by dwelling in His presence. Find your power by being in His presence. And build that relationship with Him. And know a God that loves you so much. Know a God that wants to encourage you so much. And wants to stir you and move you in the right direction. We're going to talk a little bit more about the presence next week because it's related to the next passage as well. But for this particular point, I really want us to know that number one, God's presence will never go away. Never go away. Do not forget that His presence is always with you. Seek that presence and be encouraged, empowered to act upon His Word. We're going to take a moment to pray um, into this particular thing, but we also have a special prayer request afterwards. Um, but regardless, let's, let's first take a moment to just pray first that, that God would, would, would make His presence more of a reality in our lives. That we would see Him through even the littlest things, but let's pray that, that He would give us that attentiveness to see His presence in our lives. That we would enjoy that time in His presence. That we would make time to, to enter into that presence. But let's first pray that we would never forget that He's always there with us. Um, 